the Executive Dean of the College of Business and Economics, Professor Danielle van Lul, Professor Mercy Mopinjira, our inductee this evening, Dr. Helen Du, our respondent for the evening, and a former colleague and also a colleague from Wits University. Welcome to you. Members of the Executive uh, Leadership Community of the University of Johannesburg, and a particularly warm welcome to my colleague, <coughs> Professor Sina, uh, who is the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation, members of Senate, <coughs> members of the college, uh, and the wider university community, including all our students. Guests from our sister institutions, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, San Bonani, Hienand, good evening, Tabela. It's indeed a great honor and special privilege for me to welcome you to the professorial inauguration of Professor Mercy Mapanjira. Mercy and I go back many years, so it's actually, for me, quite a special and significant occasion to be uh, officiating at her inaugural uh, ceremony this evening. As I do so, I want to express a warm word of welcome to Mercy's mother. Where are you, ma'am? Mercy's mum, good, good evening and welcome. Uh, Mercy's husband and both her sons and daughter are here with us this evening. A warm welcome to all of you. It's a very proud moment for, for you as well. Um, and I'm sure it's a proud moment for all of us here at UJ and higher education in South Africa. A professorial inauguration is a truly significant occasion in the life of the university. It represents the formal induction of a senior member of the faculty to the ranks of the academic professoriate. Inaugurations many a time tend to be very pompous ceremonies, very, very ceremonial as you can see by the dress, but hopefully they're also dignified, well-meaning and unsullied. We also told that the professorial inauguration ceremonies date back to ancient Rome as the opportunity for the formal investiture of a person into high office and it marks the formal assumption of office or position of authority. As you know, we have induction or inaugural ceremonies for presidents, etc. So do we at universities as well. The original Roman meaning of the noun professor is to confess before the public. In the late Middle Ages, the term professor was used to refer to university teachers of the highest order. While the act was no longer a confession, but rather a declaration and an exposition of one's academic discipline, the very public nature of the event remains entrenched. It is and has always been the opportunity for eminent scholars to explain the principles, procedures and objects of one's scholarly gaze to one's peers, members of the public, and to one's family. The family finally gets to know what exactly their loved one has been doing all these years. The act of professing was a prelude to the conferring of the title professor, a title that's conferred upon very few and requires that one is famous for one's work and acknowledged amongst peers in other universities. But there's more to the history of the Roman tradition of the professoriate. Professors frequently hold chairs in their disciplines. The medieval origin of the chair derives from Islam. In the Islamic tradition, the caliph himself, they were usually and always men, would appoint a kursi or a chair in a university or madrasa. The appointment was normally for life, and the chairholder would sit, sit literally in a chair surrounded by students. The kursi, like the professor, was highly esteemed and for good reasons. Perhaps the most shining example of Islamic learning in Africa was the establishment of the University of Timbuktu in Mali in the 12th century. Nine centuries ago, this seat of learning had 25,000 students 
from Africa and the Mediterranean. So from two distinct medieval traditions, one steeped in Islam and the other in Christianity, an outstanding academic elite was established. The situation is no different today. As a leading institution of higher education, the University of Johannesburg goes to great lengths to make professorial appointments that will ensure the status and the quality of the universities maintained not only for now, but for the next generation. Our professors are esteemed members of our university community. They represent their disciplines both within and outside of the university. They offer academic leadership. They're responsible for nurturing the next generation of academics and supporting them as they mature into the next generation of highly accomplished scholars. And they also ensure that we offer all our students, both undergraduate and postgraduate, a quality learning experience. But all of this requires not just being accomplished in one's discipline, but it requires additional qualities to the erudition which we primarily associate with our professors. It also requires professors and academic leaders who also show a human face, who combine academic leadership with concern and care for their colleagues and students. And in that regard, I can safely say and confidently say that Professor, Professor Mapanjira does demonstrate those human qualities. And so, ladies and gentlemen, today marks the rite of passage and the formal investiture of Professor Mapanjira into the distinguished community of university's most senior scholars. This evening, we will have the privilege of insight into one small aspect of her wealth of research and work, and also how she responds to the call for professorial leadership of the highest order. Professor Mapanjira, we certainly look forward to your inaugural address this <coughs> evening, titled Digital Technologies in Customer Experience. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you, and I now call upon the Executive Dean to introduce our inductee this evening. <coughs> thank you, Professor Anjina Parekh, our Deputy Vice-Chancellor Academic. Uh, for the wonderful introduction and giving us some insight into the person of Professor Mercy Mpenganjiro. And tonight it is my absolute pleasure to introduce her to you all. And uh, as Professor Parekh has said, to give her family and her immediate family a sense of why mum was always busy on her computer. <laughs> professor Mercy Mpenganjiro is a professor in marketing management and she holds a PhD in management, an MBA with merit, and a graduate diploma in business administration from the University of Newcastle in Australia. She also holds a BSc degree with distinction from the University of Malawi. Professor Mpingijira joined the University of Johannesburg on the 1st of July 2007 as a senior lecturer, was promoted to associate professor in 2011, and to full professor in 2016. During her time at UJC, she has served in different leadership positions, including being the HOD of the Department of Marketing Management, and she now serves as the Director of the School of Consumer Intelligence and Information Systems, one of the six big schools within the College of Business and Economics. Professor Mpikanjira's research interests are in the areas of consumer behavior, and digital marketing. Her work has been published in several books, including Principles of Marketing, Global and Southern African Perspectives, published by Pearson Education, Introduction to Marketing, published by Utah, Utah Trends and Innovations in Marketing Information Systems by IGI Global, and International Marketing by Oxford University Press. She is also an editor of the Consumer Behavior South African Psychology and Marketing Applications. 
Her track record includes 42 accredited journal publications and a further 20 conference proceedings. And their impact is reflected in an H index of 9, which means that people actually read and cite her research in their own research as they move forward. And she collaborates extensively with international scholars. And for example, these include the Bias Supply Relationship Study in collaboration with Professor Murnay Roberts Lombard of the UJ. And I see that he's sitting tonight here with a big smile, celebrating his colleague and Professor Gerdon Svensson of Christiana University in Norway. And he's also the editor of the International Journal of, of Business Reviews. Inspirational content and social media engagement behavior study in collaboration with Dr. Ernest Izugu from Iboni State University in Nigeria and the University of Hull in the UK. And Professor Mornay Robles Lombard at UJ, as well as the, well, in the field of famous, Professor Naresh Malotra, a UJ Distinguished Visiting Professor and Senior Fellow at the Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta, USA. In addition, <coughs> Professor Mbinganjira lectures undergrad and postgrad modules in marketing. She has supervised, and this is remarkable, three PhDs and 15 master's dissertations to completion, as well as two postdoctoral research fellows. Ladies and gentlemen, my absolute pleasure to introduce you to Professor Mercy Mbinganjira. Good evening. Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor Parekh, the Executive Dean of the College of Business and Economics, Professor Van Rijl, the Respondent, Dr. Heren Du. As an African, I believe that just as it takes a village to raise a child, it requires a village to produce a professor. So allow me to start this evening with acknowledging the people that are gathered here because their presence bears testament to the interest that they have in me as an individual. Starting with those of my own household, allow me to acknowledge my dear husband, Dr. Nathan Pinganjila, who has not, been, who has not only been the biggest cheerleader on the journey to professorship, but has also been an active participant on the journey. So despite him being a man of numbers, because he's a chartered accountant by profession, <laughs> my husband has read each and every single authored article that I've published to date. So yes. So yes, I've got a free editor in the house. <laughs> To my sons, Joseph and Kinley, and to my daughter, Esther, I really feel favored to have you, and thank you for bearing with me on this journey. To my mom, who has come all the way from Cheo, Malawi, I'm, great, I'm, I'm, great, um, I'm deeply grateful. Um, to my mom who has come all the way from Chewu, Malawi, I'm deeply grateful to you and thank you for being the praying mother that you have always been. It always feels, gives me peace to know that there's someone who is praying for me every day. <laughs> Love you, mom. <laughs> also present here, uh, members of uh, my Seventh day Adventist church family. Thank you for coming, Yvonne and friends, members of the Malawian community, and Kandawili and friends, thank you for being here. Friends in the academy from other institutions, members of my UJ family, including the UJ leadership, uh, I can't thank you enough. I feel at home here at UJ. <laughs> UJ is a very nice place to work for, and I say that without contradiction. 
So thank you all for being here. Uh, a special thank you to Mrs. Smith. I am really grateful for your presence tonight. Lastly and more importantly, I'm grateful to my God for granting me the desires of my heart. So all glory and honor are his. All glory and honor are his and his only. The title of my address is Digital Technologies and Customer Experience. And for those, for the sake of those who are not in the marketing field, it is in order to start with Marketing 101. <laughs> In a marketing 101 class, one of the issues that we deal with is the question of what is marketing all about? Is it about advertising? Is it about sales? The fact is, at the core of marketing is the value proposition. It is a discipline of study and practice that is concerned with value, including value creation, value communication, and value exchange. And in creating value, marketers use ideas from different disciplines. And this makes marketing a multidisciplinary field of study. Traditionally, marketing embraces ideas from the disciplines of economics, psychology, and sociology. But just as with any field of study, marketing theory and practice has evolved a great deal over the years. And today, you have got disciplines such as information technology and data science that have become core to contemporary marketing theory and practice. This is mainly due to developments in digital technologies, the internet and mobile telephony in particular. Digital technologies have brought with them new models of creating value for all types of organizations, be it the public sector as well as private institutions. If we take, for example, the retail industry, thanks to di digital technologies, today you can be able to shop for your groceries at Pick and Pay or Woolworth. You can be able to shop for your clothes at mainstream, shops like Mr. Price and Etika's without having to step your foot in any of their physical stores. In 1994, when the first item to be securely purchased over the internet was made, make headlines it did. Because the New York Times of 12 August 1994 had the headline attention shoppers, the internet is open. And fast forward to 2017, by the end of 2017, a total of 1.66 billion people worldwide bought products online, resulting in 2.3 trillion US dollars in sales. Focus show that just in three years time, by the end of 2021, we will double this, the 2017 sales, and total online retail sales will, will reach 4.9 trillion US dollars, with a total of 2.14 billion people buying products online. For another example on how digital technologies are changing the way we create, communicate, and deliver value, you just have to look at the financial services sector across Africa. Digital technologies have not only enabled you and me to be able to do our banking 24-7 and on the move through internet banking or mobile banking. Digital technologies are proving to be very useful in making sure that we address the problems associated with financial inclusion on the continent. According to the IFC report of 2018, the financial inclusion that have been enabled by developments in digital technologies present 
the biggest success story of Africa for the past decade. The fact is that for a long time, the banking sector in Africa had problems reaching the poor and the marginalized segments of our society. The result was many people were excluded from mainstream financial services. And I mean just having a bank account. And thanks to digital technologies, if you look at the figures, 2021, only 23% of those age 15 and above in sub-Saharan Africa had a bank account. Thanks to digital technologies, we have, we have turned the tide and the trajectory looks good. Because by 2027, <coughs> we have added 20% to reach for 43%. Lack of financial, lack of financial uh, access to financial services is a matter of concern because it limits the extent to which individuals and businesses can participate in economic activities, whether as consumers or as entrepreneurs. But in the race to exploit digital technologies for value creation, value communication and value exchange, Many in the public and private organizations are learning the hard way that digital technologies are certainly not synonymous with a quick win. Successful and sustainable deployment of digital technologies requires a strategy that is informed by a good understanding of customers, including their experiences with the digital products and services offered. And this is a major part of what I focus on in my research. So tonight, focusing on three themes, the experience environment and customer experience, managing interactions for positive customer experience, and customer experience, pursuit of value with ethics. My address will aim to share with you some of the findings from my work. Before going into these three themes, let me first provide a contextualization of customer experience as a marketing concept. <coughs> One of the most widely cited definition of customer experience in literature is that by Mayer and Swagger 2007, who defines it as an internal and subjective response customers have to any direct and indirect contact with an organization. Being internal and subjective means customer experience is personal in nature. When you look at customer in the customer experience, it is an inclusive word. The core is for every organization, be it private or public, and whatever form it may take, to be customer-centric. So if you are a nurse, your customers will include your patients. If you work for the city of Johannesburg, your customers will include the residents of the city. If you work for APSA, your customers will include those who hold accounts with the bank. If you are an HR partner in the faculty office, your customers will include the dean and the heads of departments. <laughs> Simply put, you are in service because there's a customer. Without a customer, there is no business to transact. And every customer journey is full of touch points. And each touch point is important because it, it, it affects the takeaway impressions that get stored in the memory of the customer and can influence how the customer eventually responds to your organization's offering. In a book entitled The Experience Economy by Pine and Gilbo, an argument is made for every organization, whether you're a manufacturer or you're a service provider, to see yourselves as staging experiences whenever you interact with customers. 
Pine and Gilmore argues that differentiation that is based on experiences is the way to go if you are to stand any chance in the contemporary competitive battleground. The quality of customer experience is normally a function of the number of experiential modules that you are able to stimulate, as well as the intensity of stimulation. So based on the concept of the modularity of the mind, there are five main strategic experiential modules, and these include the cognitive module, a customer is someone who thinks. The affective module, a customer has feelings. The sensory module, the customer has five senses. Maybe there are more these days. I don't know. I learned about five senses when I was school. <laughs> the social module, the customer is a social being and therefore relates to others. And the physical module, the, cus the customer engages in physical activity. In some of my studies, I took an interest in examining the influence of customer experience, the, 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 the influence of the experience environment on customers' internal state and how it affects behavior. So going into the first theme, the experience environment, designed for positive experience. I'll just highlight one of the articles that I've, I published in this area. It was published in a journal called the, the Management Dynamics. The fact of the matter is that when you're dealing with digital technologies, customer engagement with digital services takes place in a mediated environment. This is because delivery through electronic devices and channels such as mobile phones, the internet, or other digital self-service systems. And environmental psychologists note that the interplay between the individual and the environment can affect human response. Thus, understanding this interplay can hold the key to, to the development of models that can help in designing and in managing environmental conditions so that individuals can respond well. In this study, guided by the stimulus organism response theory, I conceptualized a model which posited that which posted that uh, web features, specifically site responsiveness, its visual appeal, which is a function of visual design, and the quality of a site contents, are important sources of stimuli that serve as precursors of flow experience and consumer behavioral response. The model further posited that the influence of website features on, on, on uh, behavioral response is mediated by the experience of flow. Now, if you look at the concept of flow, the concept of flow describes a psychological state of complete absorption in an activity or in a situation in which one is participating. For example, if you are watching your favorite soccer team on TV, or you may be an artist working on a piece of art, and you may find that sometimes you get so absorbed in what you are doing to the point that you lose track of time. So it may take, for example, four hours to finish your piece of painting. But when you finish, it doesn't feel like you have been there for four hours. So taking it to the web, you may visit a website sometimes and get out as soon as possible. On other sites, you just get absorbed and lose track of time. By the time you log out, you realize that you have spent more time online 
than you had initially planned. Now, wh while there's no consensus in literature on the best way to conceptualize flow experience, including questions of whether we should take the unidimensional approach or whether we should take multidimensional approach, uh, whether we should do reflective, um, we should take the reflective approach in terms of scale development or we should take the formative approach. Which dimensions should we use in under what context? What is clear is that flow experience is characterized by cognitive enjoyment. So you are, you are enjoying what you are doing. Focused attention, you are focused on what you are doing. And temporal distortion, because you lose track of time. Now in this particular study, flow was measured as a second order construct, as you can see. And the findings supported the posted hypothesis. You may be wondering, why should we be worried about flow? Flow is important when we at want to engage with our customers using digital platforms like the internet. We want them to come to our web. Because experience of flow means that they are going to spend more time on our website. The more time they spend there, the more they get to learn about our offerings. And because it's an enjoyable experience, it means that most likely next time they want to visit a site, if they want to come and shop, they will come to your site, isn't it? So the key message in this study is let's let the design of digital platforms not be left to chance. Let it not be about design only, but also about marketing. It needs to focus on facilitating positive customer experience. Moving on to my next theme, managing interactions for, for positive customer experience. Those of you who love to follow history, especially history to do with the web, you agree with me that um, Web 1.0 1, 1 was characterized by pages that were static in nature. And some called it info dumps because there were places where organizations posted content for customers to read without affording them much opportunity for interaction. With the advent of Web 2.0, the internet has become a dynamic social environment with enormous marketing implications. Among the effects, the advent of Web 2.0 has resulted in the emergence of a new type of a social consumer, one that is empowered to generate and share content with organizations and fellow customers around the globe and at will. One that, will, if not well taken care of, can destroy your brand in no time. But who, if properly attended to, is able to contribute meaningfully to value co-creation. In an effort to take advantage of developments associated with Web 2.0, many organizations have invested in developing online sites whose sole purpose is to facilitate the sharing of information with and between targeted customers. For organizations that sponsor such sites, the information that is shared by its users can be a good source of market intelligence. Such sites can also be used to galvanize individuals to contribute towards issues of common interest. For example, if you're a standard bank customer, you should be familiar with your online community site. Telecom also has got a community site. And Online healthy community sites 
like patients like me, med help, you may be familiar with those ones. Probably one of the most well-known online community is TripAdvisor. Now, as more and more organizations establish online communities, the science of building communities has become increasingly important. As places of social exchange, the interaction that takes place on social digital platforms such as online customer communities has the potential to influence customer experience negatively or positively. And thus, ultimately, their behavioral response to the site themselves, as well as to the organizations behind them. In my research on digital marketing, my interest has been on examining how organizations that sponsor and manage online community sites can facilitate positive user experience on their sites. Some of the findings from my research, you can find them in the ISI and Scopus Index Journals of Service Business, Information and Management, as well as in a DHET listed journal of the South African Journal of Information Management. Without going into details about each of the highlighted articles, what is evident from my research so far is that common challenges associated with successful management of online community sites relate to issues of reciprocity, issues of trust, as well as how people conduct themselves on such sites, the problem of antisocial behaviors more so in communities that are, uh, are more oriented towards hedonistic consumption, hanging out, having fun, and passing time. If we look at reciprocity, for example, how many of us use TripAdvisor when we are thinking of a, we're planning a, a holiday trip? Maybe many of us. How many of us post content so that others can benefit from our travel experiences? If you don't, what do you think would happen to TripAdvisor or like any community for that matter if it was not able to attract enough people who are willing to share content? The ability of any organization to leverage on the benefits of hosting an online customer community depends on the extent to which it is able to stimulate reciprocity. And findings from my research show that the potential that is show the potential that is there in stimulating reciprocity by growing the levels of associated social capital. On sites that are highly utilitarian, that is sites not meant for, to, to entertain, but to provide members with specific functional benefits, such as online health communities. Site managers can grow levels of associated social capital by, among other things, inviting individuals with high network value, such as experts in a, in a, in a particular field, to be part of the community. For example, if your site is aimed at patients with HIV AIDS or not so well-known ailments such as lupus, having a doctor who specializes in, that, in such a condition as part of the community or as, a, or as a regular visitor to the community can help to boost the levels of social capital associated with the site. The presence of a subject matter specialist on utilitarian community sites also helps to build trust. Now, efforts to aim at building trust <coughs> need not only attain to trust as, an, as, as, as a, uh, 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 an overall concept, but it also needs to look at the individual dimensions associated with trust, including issues of ability, issues of integrity, issues of benevolence. 
it is important to cultivate a shared sense of purpose and deal with those that don't pray by the rules decisively. Otherwise, the ability to, to leverage on online customer communities to provide value to your customers can be heavily compromised. The last thing that I want to focus on this evening focuses on digital customer experience value with ethics. Now, one common factor that is associated with human to machine or human to human interactions that are digital enabled is that they result in the generation of a great deal of data that can easily traced back to individuals. And organizations today are increasingly leveraging such data in, a, in an effort to provide their customers with personalized value propositions. However, the practices involved in collecting, in storing, in using, and in sharing such data often raises privacy and ethical questions. As part of my research, I've taken an interest in contributing to scholarship on what customers expect and how they perceive privacy and ethics in the context of digital marketing practices. In this address, I'll briefly highlight one such study which was done in collaboration with my research, with one of my research partners, Dr. Maduku. Details of the study can be found in an article published in the Journal of Business Research, which is also Scopus indexed. This study was aimed at examining customer perceptions of the ethical value of brands in mobile behavior advertising. Now, advertisements represent an important touch point on the customer journey that allows brands to influence awareness, to influence learning, as well as brand positivity including consideration and commitment. Mobile behavior advertising is a practice that entails monitoring and analyzing customer mobile browsing behavior and using that information to, to predict customers' interests and preferences and to present to them targeted ads that they are likely to find relevant. You may have noticed that when you search for products or services on your mobile phone, for example, you search for hotels in Durban, as soon as you, you finish your search, next time you log in again, you start getting lots of ads mm -hmm. that speak to what you were searching online. <coughs> the benefit of mobile behavior, of, of behavior advertising is that it helps customers to avoid clutter by ensuring the placement of ads that are likely to be of interest to them. So instead of sending you ads of baby nappies, <laughs> when you haven't shown any interest in nappies or baby products for that, ex for that matter, behavior ads will make sure that that is avoided. And like on TV, you see everything. <laughs> so while this is so, the fact that such a practice depends on the deployment of surveillance te technologies raises not only privacy, but also ethical concerns, <coughs> as it leaves customers open to manipulation by brands. In our study, we tested a conceptual model so we developed a conceptual model and tested it. The model integrates theories
from the philosophical heritage of ethics, namely the consequential ethics theory, the theological ethics theory, the virtue ethics theory, together with the communication, communications privacy management theory. A number of other theories, including the social exchange theory, the social contract theory, the fairness theory, fearless holistic theory, and reciprocity theory were, were also used to support our, the hypothesis that we had posted. So it was like mixing pup and, and, and chicken and, 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 and whatever <laughs> to come up with a model. The communication privacy management theory which was originally used in studies that were looking at sharing of private information between family members, is actually very useful to understand privacy concerns when we start collecting customers' data. The theory argues that individuals have an inherent, desire, uh, inherent need for privacy and prefer to be in control of their privacy. And one way in which they do this is by not sharing what they regard to be private information. You keep it within your own personal boundary. Whenever a need to share private information arises, careful consideration is given to who should I share my private information with. And when you share private information, the one that you share information with becomes a co-owner of the information and is expected to protect it. So the CPM, the Communication Pri uh, Privacy Management Theory, was used in our study to, to, among other things, support the inclusion of privacy concerns and its posted precursors in the model. Ethics theories, on the other hand, help define right from wrong behavior. The literature on ethics, however, shows that what may be considered right or wrong behavior can sometimes vary depending on the underlying perspective that a moral agent takes. For example, the deteological ethics theory argues that evaluation of whether a conduct is ethical or not needs not be based on the, sorry, whether ethical conduct is not, needs to be based on the intrinsic qualities of the act itself, irrespective of the consequences. So deontological ethics is rule-based and advocates for universal laws. If the rule says do not murder, it means do not murder. You cannot say this one was a suicide bomber, we needed to prevent the death of many people. If the rule says invasion of privacy is wrong, then it is wrong at all times. One of the philosophers behind the popularization of the teleological ethics theory is the philosopher Immanuel Kant, who argued that moral agents need to abstain from acts that are not in line with their, with their duty. And according to Kant, this duty needs to be rooted in a number of categorical imperatives, including the imperative to act only according to the maxim that you can, at the, at the same time, will that it should become a universal law. Simply put, do unto others as you would want them to do to you. What is good for one should also be good for the other. If it is ethical here, it should be ethical there. If it's unethical there, it should also be unethical there. You cannot have different rules for different people. The other categorical imperative, according to, my, uh, to, to, to Kant, is the need to act in such a way that you treat humanity, whether in your own person or in that of another as an end and never merely as a means to an end. 
Pu simply put, don't be manipulative. People are people. They are more important than what you want them to do. The application of the theological ethics theory in business is often associated with development of policies and rules of conduct that defines expected standards of behavior in a given context. Because it advocates universal rules, one of the criticisms that is leveled against this theory is that whose rules should we follow? So in order to avoid different definitions of what is right or wrong, it's, it's safer for the organization to develop codes of conduct and make sure that everybody is aware of those codes of conduct. So in our study, the deteriorological ethics theory supported the inclusion of general attitudes towards mobile behavior advertising and privacy management theories in the proposed model. The consequential ethics theory, on the other hand, argues, for, argues that the ultimate basis of whether an act is right or wrong should not be based on the act itself, but on its consequences. <coughs> According to the consequential ethics, uh, ethics theory, the more positive the consequences associated with an act, the more right the act should be considered to be. So based on the consequential ethics theory, moral agents can defend marketing practices that invade their customer's privacy on the basis of the benefits associated with those practices. You can defend murder using excuses like, I had to defend my family, otherwise everyone was going to be killed. In our study, consequential ethics theory supported the inclusion of perceived benefits of mobile behavior advertising and perceived intrusion, the, the, the perceived intrusiveness of the practice because according to consequential ethics theory, you have to look at the benefits and the costs. The virtue ethics theory, on the other hand, says let's not focus on the act, the intrinsic qualities of the act, or the consequences of the action. Let's focus on the actor. After all, immoral people can do good sometimes. <laughs> so the origins of the theory the origins of the, eth the virtue ethics theory can be traced back to the works of, among other philosophers, the Greek philosopher Aristotle, who argued that the purpose of ethics is, just, is not just to know good, but to become good. So in our study, virtue ethics theory was used to support our focus on brand ethical value. Now, irrespective of the underlying ethical theory adopted, all the three speak to the fact that ethical or unethical behavior comes with consequences. The findings in our study showed that uh, the findings of study pointed to the fact that uh, negative customer perceptions of digital advertising practices can affect brand ethical reputation. While this is so, it doesn't mean that brands should stop, but rather they should find ways of reducing the associated harm. So brands can mitigate this risk by pursuing harm reduction strategies, including enhancing the utility of their ads, and being open about their practices, including privacy man, man, uh, management measures that they have in place. The findings also showed that the cost of failure to mitigate for the risks can be high. The more customers start to perceive your brand as being of questionable ethical value, the more they will engage in ad avoidance, which in turn affects the very purpose of advertising. The formation of high quality customer brand relationship can also be negatively affected by customer perceptions of a brand ethical value. As the journey continues, <coughs> the quest to understand 
consumer behavior in the digital age and the psychology behind it. has been at the heart of my knowledge creation activities on my journey to professorship. Insights gained have been channeled into contributing to the development of marketing skills and capabilities, be it through contributions to textbooks used for teaching and learning, and through <laughs> sharing of knowledge with industry in industry organized forums as well as on public platforms. While significant strides have been made to create knowledge that is useful for understanding value creation using, di using digital technologies. The need for more research that can help shed light on how to optimize the ability of customers, organizations, and indeed nations to take full advantage of the value propositions associated with developments in digital technologies cannot be overemphasized. Some of the specific areas in need of more research include the areas of technology readiness, including the influence it has on the quality of customer experience with digital products and services. Research on, 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 on service design is also needed, including one that's focus, studies that are focused on providing guidance on the right mix of technology and employee-based service systems, taking into consideration the business context. Research on digital innovation ecosystems, including studies that will help us to develop programs aimed at ensuring more active participation of citizens and SMEs in Africa in the development and use of digital innovations. On, the con on a continent where SMEs make up more than 80% of businesses in many of its individual countries, we cannot afford to be slack on this one. And of course, technologies are, enab are enabling us to collect a lot of data that sometimes we don't even know what to do with it, how best to capitalize it. There is therefore need for research that will shed light on, I on issues of big data exploration, visualization, and analytics. The ushering in of the fourth industrial revolution has also brought with it unique opportunities for future research in consumer behavior and customer experience, including research that will help us understand and exploit the power of artificial intelligence, for example, to drive sales and to reduce costs. And of course, robotics are here. If a customer of NetBank, next time you, you visit them, you might just be met by our friend Pepper <laughs> at the customer service encounter. Now, as use of robotic, robotics in customer service gains ground, there will definitely be need for research that sheds light on the impact of deploying robots on customer experience. So my final remark for all the pro professionals in the marketing field is, let us embrace developments in a technology. While doing so, let us never forget that technology is simply a means to an end. So let us use it to create value through unique technology-enabled customer experience. Ladies and, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time. Ziko Mwambili, bye Danki Siabonga. Wow, what a cool talk from a cool and cute professor. Yeah. <laughs>
mobile telephony is for sure one of the greatest development in digital technology. Um, excuse me, I just got a Twitter. I hope you don't mind. Uh, where is this Twitter coming from? Ah, uh, the president of the U.S. has just tweeted, <laughs> and he's saying that he's sending his secretary to South Africa to investigate the land expropriation and the killings. Okay, I'll do my presentation now. <laughs> sorry, I'm so sorry. Another tweeter has just come in, <laughs> and the president is responding South African president is responding to the Twitter and he's saying, leave us alone. <laughs> you have your own problems to solve. Let South Africa solve its own problem. Thank you, Prof, for your presentation. Oh, excuse me again. <laughs> uh, it, uh, it's a WhatsApp, sorry, please. Let me take this call from my hobby. Hobby, what's the problem? <laughs> oh, sorry, he says he, he does not know how to use the microwave to warm his food. <laughs> can I respond, please? <laughs> Hi, Hobby, can you put two minutes on the microwave? Please be careful you don't put 22 minutes while you watch the TV because you might end up roasting the food instead of warming it. Thanks, Prof, for your presentation. Ah, uh, SMS. What's this now? Ah, uh, hello, Mrs. Monet. I got your SMS. Please, I'm coming to pick up my son. Please, just wait a minute. I'm coming. I'm on my way. I'm driving now. Uh, I need to do this thing. Ah, uh, Instagram. <laughs> Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. It's YouTube. It's YouTube music alert. The way you make me feel. The way you make me feel. The way you make me feel like a natural woman. Uh, it's just informing me about the death of Aretha Franklin. Sorry, please. I will, I will do my address now. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, Instagram. What has Lady B done now? Did she take another person's boyfriend? Oh. Colleagues, digital technology is overwhelming, isn't it? How do you experience it? How do you experience it? How do customers experience digital technology, especially from all the social media. How do we all experience it? Thank you, Prof. Pingunjira. You've enlightened us a whole lot on how we or the customers experience technology. For example, e-telling is truly working wonders. A scholar went to the U.S., and was so welcomed by a very hospitable professor in the US. And that scholar came back to South Africa and thought, how do I say thank you to this American professor? So what she did, she went online, contacted a flower company, and placed an order and inform the delivery company online, please can you uh, send a bunch of flour to this professor? And that delivery company did that seven months after. And the professor was amazed to get a bunch of flowers on her birthday from a South African scholar. That is digital technology for you. It does wonders. In terms of mobile ma uh, banking, 80% of Mozambicans own mobile phones, while only 13% of them are 
they have bank accounts. Mobile banking has facilitated fi uh, financial inclusion in this country through programs, a lot of programs. And even in Kenya, Kenya leads Africa in mobile banking with 70% of the population using mobile um, money facilities. With this development in Kenya and other uh, mechanisms by which Africans in the di diaspora exchange money and ideas with family and friends at home, Africa truly leads the world in digital financial services deployment, as Prof has just told us. This has led to what Zesky and his colleagues call reverse innovation. And they defined reverse innovation as technology developments by emerging markets, uh, emerging markets multinationals at lower cost, but with, which provides superior customer value to customers. The technological innovations are then copied by Western businesses to cater for their growing number of value-conscious consumers. Another example worth noting is Chinese companies' disruptive uh, technology called Mini Magical Child. Designed for the local market for small daily washing loads, it offered a real alternative to the large, expensive washing machines. And, in the, um, and the idea has been copied worldwide with great market success. To however successfully leverage on these value-creating opportunities, marketing managers need to develop a smart dig a digital marketing strategy, <coughs> starting with understanding the organizational market and product-related determinants of mobile marketing adoption, according to Maduku, Pingunjira, <coughs> and do 20, uh, 2016. Marketers also have to consider the flow experience in online customer community websites, according to Pingonjira <coughs> 2016. They equally have to consider information usefulness, community responsiveness, and overall trust in online information, according to Pingonjira 2018. Marketers do have to consider mobile marketing, ethics, and privacy issues, according to Pingunjira 2018. This is especially important because even patients and health carers also go online to receive advice and support from other online community members, according to Pingunjira 2018. Professor Pingonjiro, Professor Pingonjiro, <laughs> Professor Pingonjiro, <laughs> you are such a star and smart professor. Thank you. I think, I think you're all going to agree with me that we have a worthy uh, entrant into the Hall of Fame, a distinguished Hall of Fame, in the name of Professor Mercy Timpanjira. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause. Yeah. And Dr. Doa, I must say, I've chaired a number of these and officiated a number of these ceremonies. You were today one of the best. <laughs> Thank you very much. We now uh, embark on the next uh, phase, and that's the official donning of the gown and hood. Uh, and I call upon uh, Professor Mujia and the Dean to assist.